Chapter Thirteen of the Splendid Wayfaring by John G. Nyart. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. The Return. During the night after they arrived at their old camp on the Green River, Fitzpatrick's men uncovered the cache and made ready for an early start next day, while the horses, carefully guarded, grazed along the bottom. And when the sun arose, the band was already winding upstream. Fourteen mounted men and twenty-six pack horses, laden with the baggage and the costly bales of beaver. To follow the green to the mouth of the sandy would have been to risk a clash with a party of snakes, and so, coming at noon to the mouth of a creek that entered from the east, they turned off there and followed the course of the little tributary until dusk. They had now advanced a half-day's march into an inhospitable country. Two days of travel to the northward were the headwaters of the sandy, and when next morning they left the creek and ascended the low rise that bordered it they cursed the snakes most heartily for they should have been following a rich valley and now they saw ahead of them a desert country rolling drearily away to the sky rim nevertheless the prospect offered some compensation for though it seemed likely that there would be no game or grass or water yonder neither would there be any human foe all forenoon the ponies travelled northward at a swinging walk across the baked plain of whitish clay mixed with gravel where even sagebrush was scarce then the soil became sandy and soon the party was floundering through a wilderness of dunes where not even sagebrush grew with drooping heads the sweating animals laboured on through the thirsty land away to the northeast the snow-clad mountains tauntingly near to the eyes but discouragingly distant for the feet glittered in the white glare of the day the sun burned red over the rim of the melancholy waste and disappeared and the air turned chill night without wood or water or grass having paused for an hour to rest the weary animals the band forged ahead with their faces to the north star and sullenly half the night they labored on through an empty world where the soft padding of the hoofs and the wheezing breath of the horses seemed very loud so oppressive was the stillness of that dead land then when the dipper was upside down above the pole the band halted and the packs were taken off until daybreak the ponies nosed and pawed the sand nickering pitifully for grass and water in the white of the morning they were moving again at a slow stumbling pace by sunrise they had entered a rolling prairie country where once more the sagebrush grew and when the day was halfway up the sky topping a hog back the leading pony lifted his head and neighed whereat the whole cavalcade with ears pricked forward fell to nickering joyfully and the men shouted with them yonder but a mile or two away was a winding strip of green soon forty horses freed from their loads were thrusting parched muzzles into the waters of the upper sandy and rolling luxuriously in the green grass thenceforth the trail was easy and the party made good time up the little sandy through the recently discovered pass and down the sweet water to the place of rendezvous there smith and his men were waiting together with a band under the command of william l sublette who had recently come down from the bighorn intending to cross the mountains if fitzpatrick's experience in the new country should prove satisfactory sublet brought the news that major henry had recently started down the yellowstone for st louis with a boatload of furs collected at the mouth of the bighorn during the previous fall and spring and that he intended to return before winter with a pack train of supplies for the men who would probably then be operating beyond the great divide fired by the astounding stories they had heard from their comrades who had just returned from the fur country of the Siskadee, smith and sublette decided to move westward as soon as possible while fitzpatrick should proceed eastward with the beaver packs fitzpatrick now conceived a plan of characteristic daring why use horses for the trip many pack animals would be needed over yonder by his comrades and to travel with a pack train was at best a wearisome business why not make bull boats and drift down the Sweetwater and the Platte to the Missouri? The June flood was now on, and it seemed that such a journey should prove to be both swift and easy. The fact that no white men had yet navigated the turbulent upper portion of this long water course acted as a powerful argument in favor of the attempt. Large numbers of bison were grazing in the vicinity of the rendezvous, and the three combined parties now organized a hunt 
for those who were going west knew not what gameless country they might traverse in their wanderings yonder beyond the divide and it seemed best that here where game was abundant they should lay up a supply of dried meat against possible famine then while their comrades were engaged in jerking large quantities of bison flesh fitzpatrick's men wrought their bull boats john b wyeth who visited this region eight years later has left us the following description of the making of a bull boat they first cut a number of willows about an inch and a half in diameter at the butt end and fix them in the ground at proper distances from each other and as they approach each end they brought these nearer together so as to form something like the bow the ends of the hole were bent over and bound firmly together like the ribs of a great basket and then they took other twigs of willow and wove them into those stuck in the ground so as to make a sort of firm huge basket twelve or fourteen feet long after this was completed they sewed together a number of buffalo skins and with them covered the whole and after the different parts had been trimmed off smooth a slow fire was made under the bull boat taking care to dry the skins moderately and as they gradually dried and acquired a due degree of warmth they rubbed buffalo tallow all over the outside of it so as to allow it to enter into all the seams of the boat now no longer a willow basket as the melted tallow ran down into every seam hole and crevice it cooled into a firm body capable of resisting the water and bearing a considerable blow without damaging it then the willow ribbed buffalo skin tallowed vehicle was carefully pulled up from the ground and behold a boat the willow ends protruding from the rim were then cut off and the gunwales were made firm with a binding of rawhide such craft used by the indians of the plains before the coming of the white men were of great service to the trappers in navigating the shoal waters of the west for a bull boat ten feet wide by twenty-five feet long would carry over two tons with a draught of no more than four inches at length when sufficient meat had been dried and two boats were launched and loaded with the green river furs fitzpatrick's men bidding farewell to their comrades who under smith and sublette were starting for the country beyond the pass pushed off into the swift current of the sweetwater all forenoon they sped along the winding stream now in the midst of broad meadows dotted with occasional sandstone piles carved by the wind and rain of ages into curious shapes now plunging with the arrowy current through overhanging canyon walls fearsome with shadow and the sinister voice of the waters now out again into the broad sunlight of a pleasant valley where bison grazed like tame cattle and bands of elk raised their heads to stare at the strange shapes that swept along the stream noon burned down upon the boatmen and still they raced onward with the june rise expressing their huge satisfaction now and then with snatches of song compared with the plodding pace of saddle-weary horses this was like an indolent traveller's dream in which hills and valleys becoming mere pictures obligingly moved themselves to the rear filing past in a hushed and stately procession the sun was nearing the western rim and the men congratulating themselves upon a good day's run were thinking of camp when they heard a low sullen roar ahead of them now if the day had passed in a dream of travel yonder sound steadily increasing in volume as they swept onward was the voice of approaching reality as they were very soon to realize a few minutes later they shot out into the swirl where the sweet water enters the north fork of the platte then it happened pressed into a rocky channel between an island and the shore the combined floods rolled as in a great wind though the air was still suddenly the leading boat reared upon a rock like a fractious horse taking offence caught the thrust of the current on its depressed gunwale and capsized in another moment the second boat had done likewise and the turbulent channel was littered with swimming men and floating baggage within a few minutes all the trappers sputtering and puffing had reached the shore but what of the precious cargo and equipment some of it had gone down never to be recovered some had drifted into shallower water below and stranded on the rocks surely this was a rude ending for a merry day and right vigorously the drenched and crestfallen trappers cursed their luck having built several rousing fires on the bank for each had a flint and steel among his possibles 
the men stripped hung their buckskins up to dry and plunged into the swirl of cold mountain water after their baggage with great effort they managed to recover the boats some of the equipment and a sufficient portion of the fur to discharge the debt to ashley and henry for the outfit furnished at the mouth of the bighorn during the early spring fitzpatrick now decided not to risk the loss of the remaining furs by taking them downstream for being at that time still unfamiliar with the north platte he suspected that other accidents such as had just occurred might be expected before he should reach the broad quiet waters of the lower river it seemed best to hasten on with a few men to fort atkinson inform ashley at st louis as to the newly discovered hunting grounds beyond the divide procure horses and return for the furs so having cached the remaining beaver packs near the scene of the catastrophe fitzpatrick set out next morning with five men and one boat leaving the balance of the party in camp at the mouth of the sweetwater no further trouble occurred and the light craft made good time with the high water by traveling from daylight to dusk in two weeks the little band reached fort atkinson on the missouri they were thus the first white men to navigate the platte from its headwaters on the continental divide at atkinson they found a portion of the party with which general ashley had started from st louis in early may from these he learned that major henry discouraged by his many misfortunes had sold out to his partner during the previous fall and retired from the fur trade having ascended the missouri with keel boats to this point ashley had procured horses and set out with a pack train for the mountains by way of the platte valley however shortly after reaching the platte a war party of indians probably pawnees had succeeded in driving off nearly all his herd amounting to over a hundred thereupon ashley having ordered a portion of his party to return to the missouri for more horses while the rest remained with the baggage had returned to st louis jim beckworth who was a member of this party tells us that the general had recently been married and returned to transact some affairs of business and possibly to pay his devotions to his estimable lady the affairs of business were concerned with ashley's candidacy for the governorship of missouri and doubtless he returned for the election which took place in august and resulted in his defeat immediately upon his arrival at fort atkinson fitzpatrick wrote a letter to general ashley at st louis telling of the easy pass he had discovered of the rich beaver country along the green river of his affair with the snake indians and of his wreck at the mouth of the sweetwater early in september having procured a supply of horses he set forth up the valley of the platte to bring in his cached furs and the men he had left in camp there the round trip was made in excellent time for on october twenty sixth he was back at fort atkinson with all his party and the pelts that had been recovered from the turbulent waters of the north platte five days before fitzpatrick's return general ashley had arrived from st louis intent upon starting at once for the green river country beyond the great divide that he might arrive in time for the spring hunt in which the best furs were taken it was a daring if not a foolhardy project for the distance to be traversed was at least eight hundred miles by the shortest possible route winter was already beginning and the problem of feeding both men and horses on the way was likely to prove extremely difficult when ashley entered the fur trade two years before it was his intention to operate on the upper waters of the missouri and yellowstone building forts at convenient points from which his bands of trappers should receive their supplies also he had hoped to penetrate the region of the upper columbia by way of the north pass of lewis and clark but as we have seen his experiences on the missouri and the yellowstone had been rather discouraging owing to the widespread hostility of the plains indians and to the formidable competition of the missouri fur company now that fitzpatrick had discovered a rich country beyond the divide and an easy trail thereto ashley had decided to abandon the missouri yellowstone region and to push operations in the new territory on a different plan whereas before he had intended to build permanent posts at various strategic points he now decided to sweep vast scopes of country by means of wandering bands of trappers that at a certain time each year should bring the furs they had collected to some convenient place previously agreed upon there to receive supplies for the following year this annual gathering of the far-flung trappers was known as the rendezvous 
though this plan had already been employed to some extent by both the british and american traders it was due to general ashley's operations during the next few years that the rendezvous became one of the most important and picturesque features of the fur trade end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of the splendid wayfaring by john g nyhart this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil Schampf. ashley's long winter trail on november third eighteen twenty four general ashley left fort atkinson for the far-off green river intending to proceed by way of the platte the north fork of the platte the sweetwater and south pass which fitzpatrick had discovered during the spring of that year in the mid-afternoon of the second day out he came to the mouth of the loop river where the greater portion of his party had been encamped since his return to st louis during the early summer there were twenty-five men in this band and they had in charge fifty pack-horses together with all the necessary impedimenta of a trapping expedition during the summer and early fall they had fared well enough having succeeded in collecting a considerable quantity of beaver both by trapping and by trading with the occasional bands of indians however during the recent weeks they had been rather poorly fed as wild game upon which they were forced to depend for food had become scarce in that region great was their disappointment when after looking forward to ashley's coming with supplies they learned that he had brought nothing with him but planned to purchase from the pawnees whose village was located some fifty miles up the loop valley a sufficient quantity of provisions to last until the buffalo herds should be reached certainly the long and hazardous journey was not beginning well there was no singing in camp that night and no one was in a mood for telling stories winter in a wild land lay ahead of these men and there was no telling how far away the bison might be of the twenty-six men who sat in camp that night at the mouth of the loop only nine are remembered by name general ashley thomas fitzpatrick robert campbell james p beckworth moses harris generally known as black harris one clement or claymore baptiste la Junie, one le Brach, and one doorway the first three are great names in the annals of the early west beckworth then on his first trip to the mountains later became a chief of the crow tribe and won great distinction among his adopted people in their many battles with the blackfeet at one time he was celebrated from the missouri to the pacific for his yarns in all of which he figured as the hero he is said to have been poisoned by the crows in 1867 at a farewell dog feast on the eve of his intended departure for his new home on cherry creek colorado for the crows attributed their former success in the blackfoot wars to their white chief and wished to keep his bones among them if they could not have the living man black harris seems to have been another well-known spinner of yarns in his day and greatly in love with the marvellous he must have been more than ordinarily courageous and dependable for sublet more than once chose him for a companion on his long winter journeys of the last four clement or claymore is remembered vaguely as a leader of one of the ashley parties on the green river during the spring and summer of eighteen twenty five la Jeunet is only a name recorded by beckworth as that of his youthful friend la Brache did nothing more important than to get himself killed by indians during the next summer and doorway who according to beckworth was a frenchman and a good swimmer has left us nothing but his name and even that is evidently misspelled early in the morning of november sixth the party broke camp and moved up the loop river in the direction of the pawnee loop village three couriers had been sent in advance to inform the indians that ashley was coming to trade with them during the afternoon it began to snow heavily from the northeast all night the snow fell and all the next forenoon the string of men and horses pushed on through a white world soundless but for the muffled footfall of the pack animals and the whispering of the great tumbling flakes by noon the northwest wind began to blow and by dusk it was a howling fury during this time the rations of the men consisted of a half pint of flour per day for each man and now that grass was covered two feet deep the horses were fed on cottonwood bark whenever the edible variety could be found 
however the men struggled on in fairly good spirits looking forward to a plenteous supply of food in the indian town the eighth day of november dawned windless and bitter cold the men labored on patiently through the drifts up the loop valley thinking of the feast that they were going to have when they reached the pawnee loops it was mid-forenoon when the three couriers were seen returning along the rise that flanked the river these were hailed with a great cry in which the horses joined but it was not good news that the couriers brought for the pawnee loops had already left their village for their wintering grounds on the forks of the platte that evening the poorest of the horses was killed for meat two weeks passed by during which frequent attempts were made to advance but the cold was intense the snow deep and most of the time a blizzard wind was blowing from the day when the first horse was killed until the twenty first of november the party was able to advance only about twelve miles by this time many of the animals were enfeebled with hunger and cold and several had died their carcasses filled the kettles of the half-starved men on the twenty second of november the desperate party struck out across country southward and managed to reach the valley of the platte fifteen miles away there by good fortune they found an abundance of game for themselves and a good supply of rushes for the horses having spent all the next day in feasting about cosy fires in the protection of the timber that covered the bottom lands they set out once more on the morning of the twenty fourth for ten days they toiled on up the valley of the platte which yielded plenty of fuel and horse feed and their hunters kept them well supplied with the flesh of deer and elk on december third they reached plum point near the site of the present city of kearney and there the grand pawnees were encamped being on the way to their wintering ground on the arkansas river these indians strongly advised ashley to give up his original intention and to winter at the forks of the platte which they said was the only place between plum point and the mountains where fuel and horse feed could be found in sufficient quantities though the weather was now extremely cold and stormy ashley resumed the march next morning about midday the party overtook the tribe of pawnee loops whose deserted village on the loop river had so keenly disappointed the half-starved trappers during the second week of november for eight days ashley's men travelled in company with these indians reaching the latter's wintering place at the forks of the platte on december twelfth the suffering of the men during those eight days of blizzard weather had been intense and half of the horses had fallen by the way so ashley decided to spend a fortnight at this place in order to purchase horses and supplies and to prepare his party for the difficult journey that lay ahead for he had been told that little wood was to be found within the next two hundred miles the weather now turned fine and though the hill lands were still covered with two feet of snow the valleys in many places had been swept bare by the great winds and afforded plenty of dry grass and rushes for the horses the day after our arrival at the forks writes ashley the chiefs and principal men of the loops assembled in council for the purpose of learning my wants and to devise means to supply them i made known to them that i wished to procure twenty-five horses and a few buffalo robes and to give my men an opportunity of providing more amply for the further prosecution of the journey i requested that we might be furnished with meat to subsist upon while we remained with them and promised that a liberal remuneration should be made for any services they might render me after their deliberations were closed they came to this conclusion that notwithstanding they had been overtaken by unusually severe weather before reaching their wintering ground by which they had lost a great number of horses they would comply with my requisition in regard to horses and other necessaries as far as their means would admit several speeches were made by the chiefs during the council all expressive in the highest degree of their friendly disposition toward our government and their conduct in every particular manifested the sincerity of their declarations as a result of these negotiations ashley procured twenty-three horses and a liberal supply of beans dried pumpkin corn cured meat and other necessary things ten days spent in resting and feasting served to put the men and horses in fine spirits and now says beckworth everything being ready for departure our general intimated to two acts chief of the loops his wish to get on two acts objected my men are about to surround the buffalo he said 
if you go now you will frighten them you must stay four days then you may go his word was law so we stayed accordingly within the four days appointed they made the surround there were engaged in this hunt from one to two thousand indians some mounted and some on foot they encompassed a large space where the buffalo are contained and closing in around them on all points formed a complete circle their circle as first enclosed may measure perhaps six miles in diameter with an irregular circumference determined by the movements of the herd when the surround is formed the hunters radiate from the main body to the right and left until the ring is entire the chief then gives the order to charge which is communicated along the ring with the speed of lightning every man then rushes to the center and the work of destruction is begun the slaughter generally lasts two or three hours the field over the surround presents the appearance of one vast slaughterhouse he who has been most successful in the work of devastation is celebrated as a hero and receives the highest honors from the fair sex while he who has been so unfortunate as not to kill a buffalo is jeered and ridiculed by the whole band flaying dressing and preserving the meat next engages their attention and affords them full employment for several weeks arrangements for departure were made by ashley's men on the twenty third of december and on the morning of the twenty fourth bidding good-bye to their friends the pawnee loops they began the westward march again it had been ashley's intention to follow fitzpatrick's route up the north platte and the sweetwater through south pass but the loops had informed him that the north fork afforded less wood than the south fork and accordingly he had decided to ascend the latter stream the weather was fine writes the general the valleys literally covered with buffalo and everything seemed to promise a safe and speedy movement to the first grove of timber on my route supposed to be about ten days march christmas day dawned clear and the party continued to make good progress in the golden winter weather during the afternoon they were overtaken by a band of loops who had been sent out as envoys to the arapahoes and kiowas in hope that they might be able to establish friendly relations between those tribes and their own people the next day was cloudy and bitter cold in the afternoon it began to snow and blow again and the night was terrible the blizzard continued to rage until sundown on the twenty seventh and on the morning of the twenty eighth four of the horses were so far gone with the cold that even when they were lifted to their feet they could not stand abandoning the poor brutes to the wolves the party labored on so deep was the snow now that had it not been for the large herds of bison moving down the river progress would have been impossible these not only broke trail for the party but also in searching for food pawed the snow away in many places thus making it possible for the horses to graze we continued to move forward without loss of time writes ashley hoping to be able to reach the wood described by the indians before all our horses should become exhausted on the first of january eighteen twenty five i was exceedingly surprised and no less gratified at the sight of a grove of timber in appearance distant some two or three miles on our front it proved to be a grove of cottonwoods of the sweet bark kind suitable for horse food located on an island offering among other conveniences a good situation for defence i concluded to remain here several days for the purpose of recruiting my horses at this point the five loops bade farewell to the white men and each carrying on his back a small bundle of faggots for fuel struck southward toward the arkansas where they expected to find the village of the arapahoes and kiowas ten days were spent on the island during which time a strict guard was kept as ashley had been told that his old enemies the rees were among the arkansas indians standing guard the general tells us was much the most severe duty my men had to perform but they did it with alacrity and cheerfulness as well as all other services required at their hands indeed such was their pride and ambition in the discharge of their duties that their privations in the end became sources of amusement to them on the eleventh of january most of the cottonwood bark having been consumed and the horses now being in fair condition the party moved on up the river small sticks of driftwood and some occasional willow brush served for fuel but no edible cottonwood was found until the twentieth when they came to another island and camped 
here near the site of fort morgan colorado they had their first view of the rocky mountains which the general judged to be about sixty miles away ashley had been informed by the indians that it would be impossible for him to cross the mountains during the winter so he decided to move to their base and make a fortified camp from which trapping could be carried on while small bands were exploring the country in search of a pass through which the whole party might be taken later on after spending two days on the island that the horses might recuperate they continued their journey up the south platte until they reached a stream coming in from the northwesterly direction ascending this tributary doubtless the cache la poudre they camped on the fourth of february in a thick grove of cottonwood and willows among the foothills of the front range long's peak loomed huge to the southward seeming to ashley no more than six or eight miles away though the distance must have been at least thirty-five miles after leaving the camp of january twentieth game had become scarcer and scarcer and the party had been forced to rely almost entirely upon the provisions that had been procured from the loops at the forks of the platte the main body remained in camp here for three weeks during which time small detachments were busily engaged in exploring finally on the twenty sixth of february ashley began the passage of the foothills though the country was still enveloped in one mass of snow and ice our passage across the first range of mountains which was exceedingly difficult and dangerous so runs the general's narrative employed us three days after which the country presented a different aspect instead of finding the mountains more rugged as i advanced towards their summit and everything in their bosom frozen and torpid affording nothing on which an animal could possibly subsist they assumed quite a different character the ascent of the hills for they do not deserve the name of mountains was so gradual as to cause but little fatigue in travelling over them the valleys and south sides of the hills were but partially covered with snow and the latter presented already in a slight degree the verdure of spring while the former were filled with numerous herds of buffalo deer and antelope the party now crossed from the country drained by the south platte to that drained by the north platte travelling slowly northwest by west for nine days through a region almost destitute of wood they came on the tenth of march to a stream about one hundred feet wide meandering northeastwardly through a beautiful and fertile valley about ten miles in width this was the laramie river and here two days were spent in camp as the valley furnished a good supply of dry grass for the horses and an abundance of fuel moving again on the twelfth of march the party camped in the evening at the foot of the medicine bow mountains which ashley attempted to cross on the fourteenth and fifteenth but finding the snow from three to five feet deep he gave up the attempt and returned to his former camping place having rested a day the party set out on the seventeenth travelling northwardly along the base of the range as i thus advanced writes the general i was delighted with the variegated scenery presented by the valleys and mountains which were enlivened by innumerable herds of buffalo antelope and mountain sheep grazing on them and what added no small degree of interest to the whole scene were the many small streams issuing from the mountains bordered with a thin growth of small willows and richly stocked with beaver as my men could profitably employ themselves on these streams i moved slowly along averaging no more than five or six miles per day and sometimes remained two days at the same encampment on the twenty first of march the appearance of the country seemed to justify another attempt to cross the mountains and on the afternoon of the twenty third after struggling through a rough and broken country generally covered with snow the party camped on the edge of a beautiful plain with the medicine bow range behind them moving westward across the plain on the twenty fourth they camped for the night on the north platte a few miles south of the point where the union pacific railroad now crosses that stream the twenty fifth and twenty sixth days of march were spent in passing over an elevated rough country entirely destitute of wood and affording no water save what could be procured by the melting of snow sagebrush was used for fuel during the next five days the party pushed across the great divide basin which appeared to have no outlet and succeeded in crossing the continental divide at a point that later came to be known as bridger's pass during the night of the second of april a party of crow indians returning from an expedition against the snakes drove off seventeen of the white men's horses and mules 
leaving the party in a dreadful condition as the general tells us with one man ashley boldly pursued the thieves and recovered three of the animals that had strayed from the stolen herd on the fourth of april nine men were sent out in pursuit of the crows while ashley with the balance of the party laden with the packs of the stolen horses proceeded in search of a suitable encampment at which to await the return of the horse hunters on the sixth ashley's weary band reached a small stream running northwest which is now called morton creek here they found the first running water and the first wood since leaving their camp of march twenty fourth on the north platte about ten miles farther on downstream they reached another creek later known as the big sandy down which fitzpatrick had led his men just one year before here they remained in camp until the eleventh of april when the nine men who had been sent in pursuit of the crows returned without horses on the twelfth the party started down the sandy making no more than eight miles a day for the men were heavily laden and the weather was snowy and raw after travelling down the stream for six days they struck across country to the westward and in the evening of april eighteenth eighteen twenty five they went into camp on the banks of a beautiful river running south they had reached the green one hundred sixty six days after leaving fort atkinson on the missouri thus ended one of the most remarkable journeys in the annals of the west commenting thereon harrison clifford dale says in eighteen twenty four twenty five ashley plotted the first section of the central overland route to the pacific he was the first white man to travel this route in the dead of winter and the first to use that variation of south pass called by the name of one of his employees james bridger he was the first american to investigate the mountains of northern colorado the first to enter the great divide basin to cross almost the entire length of southern wyoming and the first to navigate the dangerous canyons of the green river the later exploit will be considered in the following chapter end of chapter fourteen Chapter Fifteen of the Splendid Wayfaring by John G. Nyhart. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. Down Green River. After a whole winter of difficult travel through a wild country, much of which no white man had ever seen before, Ashley had reached the chosen trapping ground with his party of foot and heavily burdened obviously men who were playing the role of the pack horse could not be expected to explore a wide scope of country in search of furs and it became necessary to cache the merchandise at some convenient place that the horses which the crows had failed to drive off might be used by the trappers however the point at which ashley was then camped was too far north for his purposes for he wished to explore the country to the southward which no white man had yet penetrated the general therefore decided to build a bull boat descend the green to some eligible point about one hundred miles below there to deposit the greater portion of the merchandise and make such marks as would designate it as a place of general rendezvous three days were spent in camp during which some of the men were engaged in making a frame for the boat while others were sent out to procure bison hides for the covering when the boat was completed and loaded with the packs ashley divided his party into four bands one of six men was to proceed to the sources of the green another of seven was to explore the region of the bear river range to the westward and a third group of six was to push southward toward the uinta mountains the leaders of the bands only two of whom are known fitzpatrick and one clement or claymore were instructed to endeavor to fall in with the parties of jedediah smith and william sublette who as we have noted had set out for the country beyond south pass at the time when fitzpatrick began his disastrous voyage down the sweetwater all the ashley men then in the mountains were to assemble by the tenth of july at a point to be marked by the general farther down the green all preparations having been made the three bands with the horses left camp on thursday april twenty first eighteen twenty five and ashley with the six remaining men began his voyage after making about fifteen miles so runs the narrative we passed the mouth of the creek which we had left on the morning of the eighteenth and to which we gave the name of sandy 
thus was named a stream destined to become famous in the great days of the california and oregon trail when migrating thousands should pour down upon it through south pass soon after pushing off that morning it had become evident to ashley's little band that the boat was too heavily laden for safety if as might be expected there should be rapids ahead so having decided to build another boat they went into camp at four o'clock in the afternoon some twenty-five miles below the sandy the new craft was finished by the evening of the twenty-third and on sunday morning the twenty-fourth they were off again making thirty miles before they tied up for the night during the twenty-fifth they drifted rapidly through twenty miles of mountainous country past the mouth of a beautiful bold running stream about fifty yards wide now called black's fork and camped on an island after making about twenty-five miles for five days thereafter they moved on downstream in a leisurely fashion without observing any remarkable difference in the appearance of the river or the surrounding country on the last day of april they arrived at the base of a lofty mountain the summit of which was covered with snow and camped at the mouth of a creek sixty feet wide now known as henry's fork that entered from the west this spot says ashley i selected as a place of general rendezvous which i designated by marks in accordance with the instructions given to my men thus far no difficulty had been encountered in the descent of the river for the channel in the most shallow places had been no less than four feet deep game had been abundant for bison were at that time travelling from the west in great numbers having spent the first of may at the mouth of henry's fork they pushed off again on the second and had proceeded only about a half mile when the mountains closed in on either side of the river rising perpendicularly to a height of one thousand five hundred feet the channel narrowed to half its former width the current became swifter and the moaning sound of shadowy waters filled the winding gorge into which the boatmen now rushed ignorant of what might lie ahead and unable to stop had they wished to do so at length rounding a bend the boat swept out into a place where the huge walls fell back leaving a pleasant little park along the margins of the stream but scarcely had the boatmen felt relief from dread when swerving sharply to the left the moaning current swirled them into a second fearsome gorge cut sheer through a lofty mountain once again they emerged into an open space and once again the dark waters swept them onward through an overhanging canyon when they emerged again into an open space some ten miles below the mouth of henry's fork they decided to call it a day and camped they had that day passed through three canyons now called flaming gorge horseshoe and kingfisher putting off in the morning of the third of may which was sunday they found the river remarkably crooked with more or less rapids every mile caused by rocks which had fallen from the sides of the mountain and these made brisk work for the crews they had made about twenty miles from their last camp when hearing a deep roar of waters in the defile ahead of them they hastily rowed to shore cautiously working their way along the bank they descended to the place from whence the danger was to be apprehended it proved to be a perpendicular fall of ten or twelve feet produced by large fragments of rocks which had fallen from the mountain and settled in the river extending entirely across the channel and forming an impregnable barrier to the passage of loaded watercraft so they were obliged to unload the boats and let them down over the falls by means of long lines which they had provided for that purpose it was sunset when this operation had been completed and the boats reloaded dropping downstream about a mile they camped for the night the falls over which they had passed have been given the name of their discoverer during his stop at this point ashley painted his name and the year on a huge boulder that had fallen from the canyon wall and the first three letters were still visible when the kolb brothers passed that way in nineteen eleven the inscription was seen by william l manley in eighteen forty and by j w powell in eighteen sixty nine during the fourth of may the boat sped safely onward in the midst of lofty heights almost entirely composed of strata of rock of various colors mostly red and partially covered with a dwarfish growth of pine and cedar 
in the morning of the fifth having dropped six miles downstream they came to a place where the mountains gradually recede from the water's edge and the river expands to the width of two hundred fifty yards leaving the bottoms on each side from one to three hundred yards wide interspersed with clusters of small willows this little valley surrounded by lofty mountain walls later came to be known as brown's hole there ashley's party remained in camp until the morning of the seventh of may when descending ten miles they camped on a spot of ground where several thousand indians had wintered many of their lodges remained as perfect as when occupied they were made of poles two or three inches in diameter set up in circular form and covered with cedar bark the adventurers had proceeded but two miles on the eighth when once again they were swept into a narrow winding canyon now called lodor the sides of which rose gloomily to a tremendous height says ashley as we passed along between these massy walls which in a great degree excluded from us the rays of heaven and presented a surface as impassable as their body was impregnable i was forcibly struck with the gloom which spread over the countenances of my men they seemed to anticipate and not far distant too a dreadful termination of our voyage and i must confess that i partook in some degree of what i supposed to be their feelings for things around us had truly an awful appearance we soon came to a dangerous rapid which we passed over with a slight injury to our boats a mile lower down the channel became so obstructed by the intervention of large rocks over and between which the water dashed with such violence as to render our passage in safety impracticable the cargoes of our boats were therefore a second time taken out and carried about two hundred yards to which place after much labor our boats were descended by means of cords about fifteen miles farther downstream they passed the mouth of the yampa which ashley named mary's river within the next few days the party succeeded in reaching the mouth of the uinta river which according to ashley the indians called the tawinti having run the rapids of whirlpool canyon where the mountains again close to the water's edge and are more terrific than any seen during the whole voyage there near the site of the present town of Ure, utah ashley's men cached the cargoes of their boats as the general had decided to ascend the uinta river to its source on the return trip to the place of rendezvous they then continued the descent of the green river passing through desolation canyon to a point about fifty miles below the mouth of the uinta the river being bounded all the way by lofty mountains heaped together in the greatest disorder exhibiting a surface as barren as can be imagined they had been travelling for three weeks down the green river never before navigated by white men and now coming to the conclusion that nothing was to be gained by continuing the voyage they abandoned their boats and started back afoot for their cache at the mouth of the uinta within a few days they fell in with a friendly band of utah indians i understood by signs from them says ashley that the river which i had descended and which i supposed to be the rio colorado of the west continued its course as far as they had any knowledge of it southwest through a mountainous country they also informed me that all the country known to them south and west from the tewinti river was almost entirely destitute of game that the indians inhabiting that region subsist principally on roots fish and horses having procured horses from the utahs the white men pushed on to the mouth of the uinta loaded their animals with the merchandise that had been cached there and proceeded up the uinta to the mouth of the duchesne which they followed through a mountainous and sterile country to its headwaters from thence they crossed the uinta mountains and came upon the upper tributaries of the weber river which ashley took to be the buenaventura a mythical stream then supposed to flow into the bay of san francisco after travelling sixty miles down the weber they fell in with a portion of the band that had set out with smith and sublet from the camp on the sweetwater during the previous summer with this band were twenty-nine men who had deserted from the hudson bay company and were now bringing their furs to the rendezvous of the american trappers from these and from a band of utahs recently encountered ashley gained the impression that the stream he had been following emptied into a lake from the western end of which a great river flowed westward to the sea 
the necessity of my unremitted attention to my business writes ashley prevented me from gratifying a great desire to descend the river to the ocean which i ultimately declined with the greatest reluctance it will be noted from this remark how little was then known of the vast central country between the continental divide and the pacific ashley could not guess that he was then seven hundred miles distant from the ocean by an airline route and that in all the vast triangular space between the snake and the colorado no river rising in the rockies reached the sea from the camp on the weber the combined party set out for the appointed place of rendezvous End of chapter 15chapter 16 of the splendid wayfaring by john g nyhart this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf the rendezvous ten weeks had elapsed since ashley's party had separated into four bands and struck out in as many directions from the camp on the green river fifteen miles above the sandy's mouth and now all the trappers employed by ashley in that country including the parties of smith and sublette who had wintered west of the divide began to arrive at the place of rendezvous their pack animals laden with the precious spoils of many a beaver stream by the first of july eighteen twenty five one hundred twenty men including the twenty-nine who had deserted from the hudson bay company were encamped on the green at the mouth of henry's fork beckworth tells us that many of the frenchmen had their squaws and children with them and that the encampment was quite a little town when all had come in the general opened his goods consisting of flour sugar coffee blankets tobacco whiskey and all the other articles necessary for that region whereupon so beckworth assures us the jubilee began some of these men had left st louis with henry in the spring of eighteen twenty two and had been in the wilderness ever since many had not tasted sugar or coffee for many months having lived entirely on the game of the country and tobacco and whiskey were luxuries not to be despised these articles were purchased at enormous prices and many a trapper not only swallowed in a day of ease what he had earned in a year of constant danger and hardship but when the rendezvous broke up found himself indebted to his employer for his next year's outfit storytelling gambling drinking feasting horse racing wrestling boxing and target shooting were the order of the day all of which were indulged in with a heartiness that would astonish more civilized societies says beckworth the free trappers who were not paid by the year as were the hired trappers but being their own masters trapped where they pleased and sold their furs at the annual rendezvous were the cocks of the walk these boasted freely with a naivete of children or homeric heroes as joseph meek tells us they prided themselves on their hardihood and courage even on their recklessness and profligacy each claimed to own the best horses to have the wildest adventures to have made the most narrow escapes to have killed the greatest number of bears and indians to be the greatest favorite with the indian bells the greatest consumer of alcohol and to have the most money to spend that is the largest credit on the books of the company if his hearers did not believe him he was ready to run a race with them to beat them at cold sledge or to fight if fighting were preferred ready to prove what he affirmed in any way the company pleased while this orgy proceeds and the year's business is being transacted let us see what of permanent value these men had accomplished in their wanderings for it is not because they brought back much beaver that we remember them now a year had passed since we last saw jedediah smith and william l sublette they were then pushing westward up the sweetwater with a string of pack horses and about fifty men and they had just said farewell to fitzpatrick bound by boat for fort atkinson with the proceeds of his spring hunt having crossed south pass and followed the little and big sandies down to the green the party was divided into three bands one under sublette one under etienne provost and one consisting of only six men under jedediah smith from this point smith turned northward moving slowly and trapping as he went following the course of the green river to the mouth of horse creek 
which comes in from the west at a point slightly south of the forty-third parallel ascending this stream to its source he crossed over to the headwaters of hoback's river which he descended to the snake river after travelling about one hundred miles down the latter stream he turned northward striking across country in the direction of clark's fork of the columbia he was now well into the territory that was being worked by the roving bands of the hudson bay company operating from various posts the chief of which was fort vancouver on the lower columbia previous to leaving the snake river he had been travelling practically the same route that had been followed by the eastbound astorians under robert stuart just twelve years before buffalo were plentiful all along the way so that the little party suffered no want also many streams rich in beaver had been found and by the end of the summer smith's horses were fairly well loaded with pelts then one day in early fall a band of iroquois indians led by a canadian half-breed named pierre came to smith's camp in a most wretched condition they were without horses and guns and were on the verge of starvation smith learned from them that they had started during february of that year from spokane house on the spokane river a branch of the upper columbia with a party of hudson bay company men under alexander ross bound for the buffalo country at the headwaters of the missouri and yellowstone they had crossed the bitterroot mountains and the continental divide with ross during the winter had hunted in the region of the three forks of the missouri during the spring and then swinging southward and westward through what is now called yellowstone national park had begun to trap on the upper waters of the snake during june they had been detached from the main party and sent southward all summer long they had wandered about taking many beaver but a week or two before falling in with the americans they had been attacked by a band of snake indians and had been robbed of horses guns and most of their peltry however they still had nine hundred skins worth at that time in st louis not less than five thousand dollars now smith was both a christian and a yankee being a christian he could do no less than give succor to those in distress being a yankee he drove a hard bargain at the same time he would escort the iroquois to pierre's hole where alexander ross was thought to be encamped with the main party and for such services he would accept the nine hundred skins in advance at least such was the story the indians told to ross the unfortunate indians having accepted smith's proposition all the furs thus far acquired were cached and the two parties started for pierre's hole they had travelled only a few days when they met a band of hudson bay men who had been sent out to find the missing iroquois and by these smith was guided to ross's camp on the salmon river near the mouth of the pashamari it was now the middle of october eighteen twenty four about the time when ashley at fort atkinson on the missouri was preparing for his long winter journey up the platte and across the rockies to the green river alexander ross was ready to start for flathead house a hudson bay company post on the upper waters of clark's fork of the columbia and smith decided to accompany him being eager to view the country and wishing to learn as much as possible about the doings of the british traders in that region surely our hero did not lack audacity on november first ross's party with their self-invited american guests crossed the bitterroot mountains by the same route that lewis and clark had taken nineteen years before and reached flathead house on november twenty sixth on the same day peter skeen ogden one of the greater leaders of the hudson bay company arrived from spokane house with an expedition bound for the snake river country ogden remained there until december twentieth when he started for the spring trapping grounds it is believed that smith having gathered all the information possible during his month's sojourn at flathead house accompanied ross southward up the bitterroot river to its source thence across the divide to the salmon river early in the spring of eighteen twenty five smith and his men after recovering the peltry they had cached during the previous fall arrived in cache valley slightly below the point where the bear river flowing southward crosses the utah line here they met sublette's party and it is easy to imagine with what eagerness the reunited comrades told of their adventures and wanderings sublette and his men had been on a wild goose chase 
though they too had succeeded in taking much fur by the way striking south and west from the mouth of the sandy where they had said farewell to the parties under provost and smith during the summer of eighteen twenty four they had come upon the upper waters of the bear river which they took to be the buena ventura they had followed this river throughout the remainder of the summer trapping as they went rounding the wasatch mountains on the north and following the stream westward and southward they had reached cache valley late in the fall and finding it a sheltered place with plenty of wood they had decided to winter there during the winter there had been much discussion among sublet's men as to what would be found at the mouth of the stream upon which they were encamped and by way of settling the discussion james bridger then but twenty years old had descended bear river to its mouth where quite naturally he had found salt water returning to winter quarters he reported to his companions what he had discovered and it was believed that he had actually reached an arm of the pacific ocean the party under provost after parting from their comrades at the sandy's mouth had pushed southward for a considerable distance along the green during the late summer of eighteen twenty four then turning westward they had crossed the upper waters of the bear and reached the weber which also empties into salt lake but by a much more direct route than that of the bear believing that he was on the buenaventura provost descended the weber but how far he proceeded before going into winter quarters is unknown there seems to be some reason to suspect that he may have reached great salt lake in the fall of eighteen twenty four and that he spent the winter there near the weber's mouth thus antedating bridger's discovery by a few months but proof is wanting at least it is known that provost van was at the mouth of the weber early in the spring also jedediah smith so ashley tells us in his letter to general atkinson had fallen on the waters of the grand lake of buenaventura meaning great salt lake on his return from flathead house before he reached cache valley thus within a few months three of the ashley bands had reached great salt lake by different routes however james bridger is generally considered the discoverer during the spring hunt of eighteen twenty five a band of hudson bay men that had been sent southward by ogden from the upper snake river country where he was then operating fell in with a small detachment of ashley men under johnson gardner on the bear river gardner had induced the british trappers to desert their employer and bring their catch worth a fortune to the american rendezvous these were the men whom ashley met in company with one of his own bands on the upper reaches of the weber during june happily gardner's right to be remembered does not rest wholly upon his rather questionable transaction his name goes linked with that of hugh glass for in the winter of eighteen thirty two when glass was killed by his old enemies the rees on the frozen yellowstone not far below the mouth of the bighorn it was johnson gardner who according to the famous traveller maximilian prince of vide nu vide followed the murderers and killed two of them with his own hands and now all the ashley men who had been widely scattered in seven bands were reunited on the green river at the mouth of henry's fork having explored the country bordering the rockies on the west from the upper waters of clark's fork on the columbia in latitude forty seven degrees thirty minutes to a point slightly below latitude forty degrees on the green river let us note the significance of what these men were doing in seventeen ninety two captain gray of the boston trading ship columbia had discovered the mouth of the great river which he named after his vessel in eighteen o five lewis and clark had crossed the continental divide from the headwaters of the missouri river and had descended the columbia to the pacific in the fall of eighteen ten major andrew henry as we have noted had crossed the continental divide and built a trading post on henry's fork of the snake river but owing to the hostility of the blackfeet he had been forced to abandon his position the next year in eighteen eleven john jacob astor's men had founded the fur trading establishment of astoria at the columbia's mouth thus by right of discovery exploration and occupation the americans claimed the great oregon country lying west of the rockies and north of latitude forty two degrees the northern boundary of the spanish domain but possession was quite another matter in eighteen fourteen as a result of the war with england astor's great enterprise had failed 
and the British Northwest Company had taken possession of Astoria, renaming it Fort George. Since that time, English traders, first the Northwest Company, then the Hudson Bay Company, had been the lords of the land, although an agreement had been made in 1818, whereby the British and the Americans were to have equal rights in the Oregon country. But so long as the Americans knew no overland route save those that had been followed by Lewis and Clark and by the Astorians, joint occupancy virtually meant British occupancy, for the northern passes across the Rockies were very difficult to cross, and the inveterate hostility of the Blackfeet made that way extremely hazardous. Had not a more advantageous road been found to cross the Continental Divide during those early years, it is most probable that the English would have become permanently established throughout the territory drained by the Columbia system. For always, the flag follows the traitor. Thomas J. Farnham, who traveled overland to Oregon in 1839-40, when the stream of emigration was already beginning to flow across the Rockies, made the following just observations regarding the great central route to the Pacific. The Platte, therefore, when considered in relation to our intercourse with the habitable countries of the Western Ocean, assumes an unequaled importance among the streams of the great prairie wilderness. But for it, it would be impossible for man or beast to travel those arid plains, destitute alike of wood, water, and grass, save what of each is found along its course. Upon the headwaters of the North Fork, too, is the only way or opening in the Rocky Mountains at all practicable for a carriage road through them. That traveled by Lewis and Clark is covered with perpetual snow that near the debouchure of the South Fork of the river is over high and nearly impassable precipices that travel by myself farther south is and ever will be impassable for wheel carriages. But the Great Gap, South Pass, seems designed by nature as the great gateway between the nations on the atlantic and pacific oceans dr john mclaughlin factor of the hudson bay company's post at fort vancouver used to say for all coming time we and our children will have uninterrupted possession of this country as it can never be reached by families but by water around cape horn and upon being told that he would live to see the coming of the yankees he would answer as well might they undertake to go to the moon. He was thinking of the northern passes. But now Ashley's men under Fitzpatrick had found a great natural road leading up the valleys of the Platte and the Sweetwater over the scarcely noticeable divide at South Pass, and Ashley himself had traveled a variation of this route by way of the South Platte and Bridger's Pass. The gateway of the mountains had swung open at last, and henceforth there would be no lack of americans in the country west of the rockies it was the beginning of the invasion of the far west in course of a few years the settlers would follow the trail of the trappers in ever increasing numbers until when the river of humanity should be in full flood forty years later ten thousand wagons bound for oregon and california would trundle up that way in a single season down from the north as far as snake river had come the english up from the south penetrating the wilderness as far as utah lake and spreading up the coast of california had come the spaniards between the countries known to the british and the spanish lay an unknown land and now at the green river rendezvous in july eighteen twenty five already were gathered together some of those who within the next two years were destined to lift the veil of mystery from that vast triangular space end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of the splendid wayfaring by john g nyhart this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Phil Schempf Back to the States Ashley's luck, which, as we have seen, had been bad enough so long as he operated east of the Rockies, had now turned. Not only had his own bands brought in a large quantity of beaver to the Green River rendezvous, but from the 29 Hudson Bay Company trappers, who had deserted from Ogden's party, he had procured a fortune for a mere song, as he is said to have remarked. Says Beckworth, 
there lay the general's fortune in one immense pile collected at the expense of severe toil privation suffering peril and in some cases loss of life the skins he had purchased from ogden's men and from free trappers had cost him comparatively little if he should meet with no misfortune on his way to st louis he would receive enough to pay all his debts and have an ample fortune besides the exact quantity of beaver fur collected by ashley at the rendezvous of 1825 is not known contemporary estimates vary from forty to one hundred thirty packs of one hundred pounds each the valuation ranging from forty thousand to two hundred thousand dollars it is probable that he collected no less than one hundred thousand dollars worth of furs an imposing fortune in those days when the purchasing power of a dollar was far greater than now the packs were all arranged continues beckworth and our salt lake friends the deserters offered him ashley the loan of all the horses he wanted and engaged to escort him to the wind river all preparations for the return to st louis being completed ashley bade farewell to those who were remaining in the country and set out with a large pack train and fifty men half of the latter being ogden's trappers who would return with the horses after the general had reached a point on the bighorn from whence he could proceed by water to the states jedediah smith was one of those who were chosen to accompany the general to st louis it is probable that ashley would have attempted to navigate the sweetwater and the platte had not fitzpatrick's voyage of the previous summer resulted in disaster he himself was unfamiliar with the bighorn and the yellowstone having ascended with major henry only to the mouth of the latter river in eighteen twenty two but a number of those who were now returning with him had ascended the yellowstone with henry in the fall of eighteen twenty three and had followed up the bighorn on their way to south pass during the spring and summer of eighteen twenty four following the green northward from henry's fork to the mouth of the big sandy ashley's party ascended the latter and crossing the great divide at south pass came on the upper reaches of the sweetwater here the main body with the pack animals turned northward toward the popoagi while ashley with twenty men and twice as many horses proceeded downstream in order to recover forty-five packs of beaver that sublet's party had collected during the spring hunt of eighteen twenty four and cached before pushing on across the mountains to the green during the following summer within a few days after separating from the main party ashley's men had raised the cache and started in a northwesterly direction to rejoin their comrades on the wind river when they were attacked by a band of blackfeet three times their own in number they made their appearance at the break of day yelling in a most hideous manner writes ashley and using every means in their power to alarm our horses which they so effectually did that the horses although closely hobbled broke by the guard and ran off a part of the indians being mounted they succeeded in getting all the horses but two and wounded one man an attempt was also made to take our camp but in that they failed during the next night ashley sent out a small band to find the main body of trappers and bring back horses with which to transport the furs knowing the character of jed smith it seems a reasonable guess that he led this band during the second day after the battle the little party returned safely with the necessary animals and ashley proceeded on his way none the worse for his encounter with the blackfeet after making about ten miles he camped that night about twelve o'clock the general tells us we were again attacked by a party of crow indians again beckworth who was with ashley is on hand with the particulars i and my boy baptiste la jeunesse were sleeping among the packs as were also some of the other men when the sentinel came to me to tell me that he had seen something which he believed to be indians i arose and satisfied myself that he was correct i sent a man to acquaint the general at the same time awaking the boy and two men near me we noiselessly raised ourselves took as good aim as possible and at a signal from me all four fired we saw two men run by this time the whole camp was aroused our whole force was on guard from that time till the morning when we discovered two dead indians lying where we had directed our aim in the night we at first supposed the two indians belonged to the blackfeet but we subsequently found they were crows 
one of them wore a fine pair of buckskin leggings which i took from him and put on myself during the day after this slight affair ashley's band overtook the main party probably near the mouth of the popo aggie which flows northwardly into the wind river shortly after this while the reunited bands were moving down the wind river they encountered a large band of indians again beckworth will oblige us the alarm was given and on looking out we saw an immense body of them well mounted charging directly down upon our camp every man seized his rifle and prepared for the living tornado the general gave orders for no man to fire until he did by this time the indians were within half pistol shot greenwood one of our party pronounced them crows and called out several times not to shoot we kept our eyes upon the general he pulled trigger but his gun misfired and our camp was immediately filled with their warriors most fortunate it was for us that the general's gun did misfire for they numbered over a thousand and not a man of us would have escaped to see the yellowstone greenwood who knew the crows acted as interpreter between our general and the indian chief whose name was absaroka batetsa sparrowhawk chief after making numerous inquiries about our success in hunting the chief inquired where we were from from green river was the reply you killed two blackfeet yes where are their scalps my people want to dance don't show them cried greenwood to us turning to the indian we did not take their scalps Ugh, that is strange during this colloquy i buried my scalp in the sand and concealed my leggings knowing they had belonged to a crow the chief gave orders to his warriors to move on many of them keeping with us on our road to their camp which was but a short distance off soon after reaching there an indian woman issued from a lodge and approached the chief she was covered with blood and crying in the most piteous tones she addressed the chief these are the men who killed my son and you will not avenge his death she was almost naked and according to their custom when a near relative is slain had inflicted wounds all over her body in token of her deep mourning the chief turned to the general then said the two men who were killed in your camp were not blackfeet but my own warriors they were good horse thieves and brave men one of them was a son of this woman and she is crying for his loss give her something to make her cease her cries for it angers me to see her grief the general cheerfully made her a present of what things he had at hand to the value of about fifty dollars now said the chief to the woman go to your lodge and cease your crying she went away seemingly satisfied during the day two other indians came to the encampment and displaying each a wound said see here what you white people have done to us you shot us white people shoot good in the dark the general distributed some presents among these two men happening to look among their numerous horses we recognized some that had been stolen from us previous to our reaching green river the general said to the chief i believe i see some of my horses among yours yes we stole them from you what did you steal my horses for i was tired with walking i had been to fight the blackfeet and coming back would have called at your camp you would have given me tobacco but that would not carry me when we stole them they were very poor they are now fat we have plenty of horses you can take all that belong to you the chief then gave orders for them to deliver up all the horses taken from our camp now following the wind river to where it enters the bighorn mountains ashley detailed a small band to explore the canyon by water while he with the rest of the men and the pack train pushed on over the range by way of bad pass a distance of about thirty miles on august seventh they reached the point where the bighorn river issues from the mountains here twenty-five men turned back with the horses and with the other twenty-five ashley having built bull boats for the purpose began his voyage to the states with his precious cargo no difficulties were met in descending to the mouth of the yellowstone where the party arrived at midday on august nineteenth in effecting a landing at the junction of the two rivers so beckworth informs us we unfortunately sunk one of our boats on board of which were thirty packs of beaver skins and away they went 
floating down the current as rapidly as though they had been live beaver all was noise and confusion in a moment the general in a perfect ferment shouted to us to save the packs all the swimmers plunged in after them and every pack was saved the noise we made attracted a strong body of u s troops down to the river who were encamped near the place and officers privates and musicians lined the shore they were under the command of general atkinson then negotiating a treaty with the indians of that region on behalf of the government general atkinson and our general happened to be old acquaintances and when we had made everything snug and secure we all went into camp and freely indulged in festivities it will be remembered that here on the tongue of land between the two rivers major henry had built a fort in the fall of eighteen twenty two after it was abandoned a year later the indians set fire to it but ashley found three sides of the stockade and part of the building still standing general atkinson was about to start up the missouri for the purpose of making a treaty with the blackfeet and ashley decided to accompany his old friend after ascending to the mouth of the porcupine and finding no indians the expedition returned to the mouth of the yellowstone within a week ashley now abandoned his clumsy bull boats and transferred his cargo to a stauncher craft furnished by general atkinson on the twenty seventh of august the combined force of soldiers and trappers began the descent of the missouri and on the nineteenth of september arrived at council bluffs that is to say at fort atkinson here ashley's party remained three days which passed in continual festivities the trappers feeling themselves almost at home let betworth finish the account of ashley's homeward voyage providing ourselves with a good boat we bade adieu to the troops and continued our descent of the river the current of the missouri is swift but to our impatient minds a locomotive would have seemed too tardy in removing us from the scenes of hardship and privation to the homes of our friends our sweethearts our wives and little ones those who reside in maritime places and have witnessed the hardy tars step ashore in their native land can form an adequate idea of the happy return of the mountaineers from their wanderings on the plains to st louis which is the great seaport arriving at st charles twenty miles above st louis the general dispatched a courier to his agents messieurs warndorf and tracy to inform them of his great success and that he would be in with his cargo the next day about noon when we came in sight of the city we were saluted by a piece of artillery which continued its discharges until we landed at the market-place there were not less than a thousand persons present who hailed our landing with shouts which deafened our ears those who had parents brothers and sisters wives or sweethearts met them at the landing and such a rushing crowding pulling hauling weeping and laughing i never had before witnessed every one had learned of our approach by the courier our cargo was soon landed and stored the men receiving information that they would be paid off that afternoon at the store of messrs warndorf and tracy we reported thither in a body to receive our pay the full amount was counted out in silver to each man accordingly we all repaired to barris's hotel and had a glorious time the house was thronged with our friends besides who all felt themselves included in the general's hospitality general ashley called on us the next morning and perceiving that we had run all night told us to keep on another day at his expense adding that if we wished to indulge in a ride he would pay for carriages we profited by his hint and did not fail to take into our party a good share of lasses and mountaineers the next morning the general again visited us and seeing we were pretty sober paid the bill End of chapter 17chapter eighteen of the splendid wayfaring by john g nyhart this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf general ashley retires after the rendezvous had broken up in july and ashley's party had begun the journey to st louis with the furs the body of trappers left behind under the command of sublette moved leisurely up the green river for a considerable distance 
then having agreed upon cache valley as the place for the fall rendezvous the trappers separated into small parties and spent the summer working along the streams in the country east of the wasatch mountains it was along about the end of october eighteen twenty five and the winter was already setting in when one of the small bands that had worked its way to the headwaters of the salt river during the fall hunt fell in with three men who had just arrived from st louis with a letter for sublet from general ashley the three men were james p beckworth one laroche and one pello it would appear that during his homeward journey ashley had concluded that he was wealthy enough to retire and it is probable that he had discussed with jedediah smith some proposition regarding the sale of his mountain interests to a new firm of which smith and sublette should be members it was doubtless with this in view that shortly after arriving in st louis he had induced beckworth and his two companions to carry a message to sublette far away beyond the great divide beckworth tells us that he received a thousand dollars for the trip and considering the great risk that so small a party ran such remuneration could hardly be regarded as excessive though it is likely that far less was received setting forth from st louis with two riding horses and a pack mule for each these three men had followed the missouri river to the mouth of the platte ascended the latter to the forks thence proceeding by way of the north platte and the sweetwater through south pass to the green after pushing up the green to the mouth of labarge creek they had struck across country northwestward to the headwaters of the salt river which empties into the snake river where the latter crosses the eastern boundary of idaho the trappers whom they met at this point were about to start for the rendezvous in cache valley and beckworth decided to accompany them to that place there to await the arrival of sublet rather than to search for him in the wilderness it was late in october when the widely scattered bands had at last reunited in cache valley and sublet's party was the last to come in upon arriving sublet gave orders for the whole camp to prepare for the march to the mouth of the weber river where he had decided to winter at this time the ashley men including hired trappers free trappers and those who had deserted ogden must have numbered about one hundred most of these had taken indian wives some had children and as many horses were required to transport the impedimenta of such a camp the procession that trailed out of cache valley must have been rather impressive joseph meek who became one of sublet's trappers four years later has left us the following account of the manner in which such a party traveled when the large camp is on the march it has a leader generally one of the bushways who rides in advance or at the head of the column near him is a led mule chosen for qualities of speed and trustworthiness on which are packed two small trunks that balance each other like panniers and which contain the company's books papers and articles of agreement with the men then follow the pack animals each one bearing three packs one on each side and one on top so nicely adjusted as not to slip in traveling these are in charge of certain men called camp keepers who have each three of these to look after the trappers and hunters have two horses or mules one to ride and one to pack their traps if there are women and children in the train they are all mounted where the country is safe the caravan moves in single file often stretching out for half or three-quarters of a mile at the end of the column rides the second man or little bushway usually a hired officer whose business it is to look after the order and condition of the whole camp on arriving at a suitable spot upon which to make the night camp the leader stops dismounts in the particular space which is to be devoted to himself in its midst the others as they come up form a circle the second man bringing up the rear to be sure all are there he then proceeds to appoint every man a place in the circle and to examine the horses backs to see if any are sore the horses are then turned out under guard to graze but before darkness comes on they are placed inside the ring and picketed by a stake driven in the earth or with two feet tied together so as to prevent easy or free locomotion the men are divided into messes so many trappers and so many camp keepers to a mess the business of eating is not a very elaborate one where the sole diet is meat either dried or roasted 
by a certain hour all is quiet in camp and only the guard is awake in the morning at daylight the second man comes forth from his lodge and cries in french leve 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 which is the command to rise in about five minutes more he cries leche lego leche lego or turn out turn out at which command all come out from the lodges and the horses are turned loose to feed but not before a horseman has galloped all around the camp at some distance and discovered everything to be safe in the neighborhood again when the horses have been sufficiently fed under the eye of a guard they are driven up the packs replaced the train mounted and once more it moves off in the order before mentioned thus ashley's men with their women children and horses move down the bear river to salt lake and along the border of the lake southward to the mouth of the weber where they establish themselves in their skin tents for the winter now that the trapping season was over the men had a comparatively easy time having little to do but to take turns in supplying the camp with meat and to indulge themselves in eating sleeping and swapping yarns for we may be sure that most of the more menial duties about camp such as cooking and fetching wood and water were willingly performed by the squaws as being well beneath the dignity of their lords joseph meek describes certain features of domestic economy in these winter camps when a piece of game is brought in a deer or an antelope or buffalo meat it is thrown down in front of the bushway's lodge and the second man stands by and cuts it up or has it cut up for him the first man who chances to come along is ordered to stand still and turn his back to the pile of game while the little bushway lays hold of a piece that has been cut off and asks in a loud voice who will have this and the man answering for him says the bushway or perhaps number six or number twenty meaning certain messes and the number is called to come and take the meat in this blind way the meat is portioned out the bushway faring no better than his men not long after winter quarters had been established so we are told by beckworth who was there a party of bannock indians swooped down upon the camp one stormy night and drove away eighty of the white men's horses here was work that could not be allotted to the squaws and such work as the trappers seemed rather to enjoy fifty men immediately volunteered to pursue the bannocks and it is safe to guess that most of those who had been on green river in the spring of eighteen twenty four and had shared in the attack on the snake village were of this band which like the former one was led by fitzpatrick early next morning the horse hunters set out afoot the storm had died in the night and as much snow had fallen the stolen herd had left a trail that was easily followed after trudging five days in a northerly direction the trappers came at last in sight of the bannock village fitzpatrick now divided his party into two bands one of which was led by himself the other by the young daredevil james bridger who was to drive away the bannock horses while fitzpatrick and his men charged the indians numbering about three hundred it was surely an audacious plan but it seemed to have worked perfectly the whole bannock herd was driven away though many of the horses were later recovered by the indians we succeeded in getting off with a number of our own missing horses and forty head besides says beckworth who shared in the enterprise in the engagement six of the enemy were killed and scalped while not one of our party received a scratch the horses we captured were very fine ones and our return to camp was greeted with the liveliest demonstrations when the horse hunters reached winter quarters they found there an encampment of snake indians numbering over a thousand these so beckworth tells us had entirely surrounded us with their lodges adding very materially to our population they were perfectly friendly and we apprehended no danger from them it appears that this was their usual resort for spending the winter during the absence of fitzpatrick's party sublet owing doubtless to the letter received from ashley had decided that his business interests made necessary his presence in st louis and he had started with but one companion black harris on the trail that led back to the states one thousand five hundred miles away across the blizzard-swept prairie wilderness 
the wintering party all strong and healthy as bears as we are assured now settled down to a comfortable and neighborly existence in company with their snake friends the presence of whom made unlikely any further attack by marauding bands of horse thieves so passed the winter of eighteen twenty five twenty six early in the spring of eighteen twenty six four men whose names are not recorded set out in small bull boats from the camp at the mouth of the weber river to skirt the shore of the great salt lake their purpose was to locate beaver streams and to find the place whence the buenaventura issued flowing westward to the ocean after three weeks these men having circumnavigated the lake returned to camp with a tale of unprofitable labors they had found neither beaver nor the buenaventura and they had suffered much with thirst for most of the streams that entered the lake were saline at that early season before the flood waters of the melting snow had washed them clean during the absence of the exploring party the main body had been preparing to leave winter quarters and begin the spring hunt many of the skins which had been used for lodges and were therefore thoroughly cured by the smoke of the winter fires were cut up and made into moccasins for the party smoked skins do not shrink with wetting as raw skins do this is an important quality in a moccasin so joseph meek tells us as a trapper is almost constantly in the water during the trapping season and should not his moccasins be smoked they will close upon his feet in drying like a vice sometimes after trapping all day the tired and soaked trapper lies down in his blankets at night still wet by and by he is wakened by the pinching of his moccasins and is obliged to rise and seek the water again to relieve himself of the pain for the same reason when the spring comes the trapper is forced to cut off the lower half of his buckskin breeches and piece them down with blanket leggings which he wears all through the trapping season the whole body of trappers and indians now broke camp and moved together up bear river to cache valley where forty-five packs of beaver collected during the previous fall were cached during this operation two french canadian trappers were killed by the caving in of a clay bank in which they were digging and beckworth with his usual loquacity tells us that he fell heir to the widow of one of these unfortunates she was of light complexion says he smart trim and active and never tired in her efforts to please me seeming to think that she belonged to me for the remainder of her life i had never had a servant before and i found her of great service to me in keeping my clothes in repair making my bed and taking care of my weapons from cache valley the trappers started on the spring hunt pushing over to the headwaters of the port neuf and down that stream to its junction with the snake river finding plenty of beaver all the way at this point they seem to have had a brisk encounter with a large band of blackfeet as a result of which they lost three horses however they took some scalps by way of partial remuneration they then turned back ascending the port neuf to its headwaters from whence they crossed over to the bear river continuing the hunt along that stream and its tributaries until they reached the mouth of sage creek there they met black harris and one portalace who had just arrived from the states these brought the news that ashley smith and sublette were but a short distance away bound for salt lake with fifty men and a pack train of one hundred horses and mules having begun the journey from st louis in early march upon receiving this news the trappers hastened back to salt lake being joined on the way by the snake indians who had spent the previous winter with them shortly after they reached the appointed place of rendezvous on salt lake ashley's party came in with a pack train heavily laden with merchandise and the business of the rendezvous began it may well be supposed so beckworth remarks that the arrival of such a vast amount of luxuries from the east did not pass off without a general celebration mirth songs dancing shouting trading running jumping racing target shooting yarns frolic with all sorts of extravagances that white men or indians could invent were freely indulged in the unpacking of the medicine water alcohol contributed not a little to the heightening of our festivities however the festivities were rudely interrupted during the second day when a body of blackfeet prowling in the vicinity surprised and killed five of the snake indians who were gathering roots at some distance from the camp whereupon the snake chief went to sublette and said 
cut face three of my warriors and two women have just been killed by the blackfeet you say that your warriors can fight that they are great braves now let me see them fight that i may know your words are true sublette replied you shall see them fight and then you will know that they are all braves that i have no cowards among my men and that they are all ready to die for their snake friends beckworth whom we have been quoting tells us that the ensuing battle continued for six hours after which sublette's men having become very hungry as a result of their violent exercise retired to their camp requesting that the snakes remain on the field and finish the job but the snakes it seems had also developed considerable appetites by this time and concluding that under the circumstances they would rather eat than fight they followed their allies to the feast so the battle ended pleasantly enough during the rendezvous general ashley completed arrangements with jedediah smith david e jackson and william l sublette whereby he transferred his interests in the mountains to the firm of smith jackson and sublette agreeing to furnish the new company with goods from the states and to dispose of its furs on a commission basis the articles of agreement were drawn up and signed on july twenty sixth eighteen twenty six near the grand lake west of the rocky mountains before leaving the country for the last time so beckworth informs us the general delivered the following farewell address mountaineers and friends when i first came to the mountains i came a poor man you by your indefatigable exertions toils and privations have procured me an independent fortune with ordinary prudence in the management of what i have accumulated i shall never want for anything for this my friends i feel myself under great obligations to you many of you have served with me personally and i shall always be proud to testify to the fidelity with which you have stood by me through all danger and the friendly and brotherly manner which you have ever one and all evinced toward me for these faithful and devoted services i wish you to accept my thanks the gratitude i express to you springs from my heart and will ever retain a lively hold on my feelings my friends i am about to leave you to take up my abode in st louis whenever any of you return thither your first duty must be to call at my house to talk over the scenes of peril we have encountered and partake of the best cheer my table can afford i now wash my hands of the toils of the rocky mountains farewell mountaineers and friends may god bless you all end of chapter eighteen